Welcome to the Northeast Kingdom Voice. I'm your host, Scott Wheeler. Today's guest is Senator Vince Aluzzi. Senator Aluzzi has spent the majority of his adult life in the Vermont State House. Welcome to the show, Vince. Well, thanks, Scott. Nice to be here with you. Um, you know, I can't, personally, I can't even remember a time when there wasn't a man down here that was called a Senator Aluzzi. Because, you know, <laughs> I, 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 what year was that? 1980. 1980. I was in junior high, yep. so I wasn't really paying attention to politics. So, all of my growing years was spent with you being down there. Yep. So, yep. were you the youngest member? Youngest member of the Senate ever elected since it was created in 1836, when Vermont was first uh, formed as a state. There was no Vermont Senate. Right. There was a Council of Censors, right. and then in 1836 they created the Vermont Senate. And uh, I'm, I, I'm very proud to say that I was the youngest ever elected. So did you, did you defeat somebody or did you go into an open seat? Uh, the, in 1980, the uh, election uh, was uh, Senator Melvin Mandigo was running for re-election and Senator John Boylan from Island Pond was retiring. And so there was an opening. And uh, I, I was encouraged by a number of folks in the area who thought I had done a good job as a deputy state's attorney prosecuting cases in the county uh, to, uh, to, to run for the position and, um, of course, was successful. And how old were you? I was 26 when I started. My birthday's in September, so by November I just turned 27. So you're kind of like a, a walk-in textbook of the history of the Vermont legislature in the last 30-plus years. Well, you're, you're almost, you've almost been there as long as the good Senator Doyle. That's right. In fact, I have second seniority to Senator Doyle. He was elected in 1968, started in 69, so he had um, about 11 years on me. Uh, also of interest is that uh, when I was uh, growing up in the Barry montpelier area, Senator Doyle gave me what were then called senatorial scholarships to attend college. They were up to $300 a year, helped to buy books and supplies. So it was interesting to then join the ranks of uh, Senator Doyle, with Senator Doyle. And as time has passed, you know, a lot of the members have uh, chosen to not run for re-election and have retired or have died. And so as time has passed, I have the number two seniority spot in the Senate. And you know the good thing about Senator Doyle is uh, not only is he a respected legislator, and not only is he a brilliant man, but he's a he's a good man. Yes, I've very, he's a very kind person. Uh, continues to work full time at Johnson State College, even though he's in his late eighties, and is well loved by everybody. Even though he runs as a Republican uh, party takes a second place because he has been so active in attending events there that everyone knows him personally. So when he runs for re-election, he doesn't have to worry about the party label uh, or anything else, very frankly. Uh, people just enjoy him and uh, work with him and uh, vote for him. Now, have you seen much change in the legislature over the last 30 plus years? Tr tremendous. Uh, when I first started, uh, it was the attitude of most members, at least on the Senate side, that they were there to perform a public service. Most were successful business people, uh, retired uh, either in business or from some other profession, um, and they felt they had a duty to serve. Uh, they didn't come with a particular agenda. Of course, there were always regional issues, mm -hmm. state issues, uh, but they were there really to, uh, to give back to the community. The legislators that run and are elected today are, are I think, are, are classified more as activists. They, they have an agenda. They have specific issues that they want to push Vermont beyond uh, what is the comfort zone for a lot of people. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Vermont uh, has a lot of great policies. You know, we're very uh, progressive when it comes to investing in kids. Right. Uh, something I share, a uh, view that I share because if you invest in children and get them off on the right foot in life, the chances are that you won't have to then spend money on the back end, correctional facilities and uh, mental health issues and, right. and the other problems that plague society when the kids uh, at the very young age don't receive proper education and support, nutrition, bonding, that kind of thing. Because okay. uh, as the viewers 
may be aware of, I also served with you in the That's State right. House for a number of years. I served in the Vermont House, and uh, to tell you the truth is, um, I wasn't a stranger to the State House simply because off and on throughout uh, the years, I have also served as a reporter at the State House. So I got I got an idea of the way things worked, but right. it was a real eye opener. But I think I think. Um, by the time I arrived on the scene, the system was well on its way to having its broken pieces, such as um, I often found that a lot of the, a lot of uh, the hearings were just uh, trumped up here. Yeah, pro forma. Right, and, right. And how people went down here, and they thought they were being heard, but I found that a lot of the decisions were actually already made. And a lot of it, a lot of the uh, the testimonies were just to just so you could check off your list and say, well, I spoke to this type of person, mm -hmm. I spoke mm -hmm. to that, and uh, that was that was kind of disheartening uh, for me. Right. Well, public hearings are to afford you know those who are not in government or at the state house every day an opportunity to participate, but by and large, uh, the only purpose the public hearing serves is to give. Uh, legislators on either side of the issue ammunition right. they can say well at the public hearing so-and-so spoke in support of the position I advocate and another person will say well we had a public hearing and I very frankly thought the testimony of those on the other side of the question were, was compelling so uh, a lot of the decisions are made uh, uh, in private conversations uh, offline if you will uh, and uh, that's I think the way democracy works not only at the state house but really city councils select boards uh, and in congress and you know what is a lot of people say our system's broken i happen not to really totally believe that is i think how we choose our people to represent us is because a lot of times you know i've no i've watched some very good senators and representatives get kicked out over the years and a lot of times they were very good at their job but they didn't have the flash or the pizzazz right. that so many voters are looking to vote for somebody with the right sound bites. That's right and uh, now with the uh, importance of television it's all about 30 second uh, commercials and that is somewhat disappointing because the folks who do not want to play in that arena oftentimes fall by the wayside and, and you lose a wealth of right. experience and knowledge and professionalism that would otherwise uh, come to, to the forefront. Oftentimes uh, in these days you have people elected who really have no other job but to run for the legislature and one of the nice things about the legislature particularly dating back to when I started in the 1980s is that you had these very successful uh, business owners and community leaders bring that experience to the state house uh, people who know how to balance a checkbook people who worked in the private sector people who struggled uh, with uh, making ends meet and now it's uh, really a, a, a different uh, group that seems to right. want the jobs and get elected to them and uh, I'm not sure that that's bad but it certainly is different and, and I notice one thing is, if you see people arrive with a business background, uh, and to a degree that includes myself, they don't stay long because they get frustrated by the whole system. It's like, right. you might know more of the details, but I was shocked to just really read that Senator Karras is, has stepped down. That's right. And, and per, I don't know how you got along with him, but I, thought, I felt that he was a, just a fine man. He was a big businessman. He mm -hmm. understood things. Right. And, you know, you might know why he stepped down. Well, I, I helped write his letter of resignation. Right. Uh, he served on my committee, the Senate Economic Development Committee. Uh, when I ran for auditor, he was my Rutland County right. campaign chair. Now, get a load of this. He is, the, he, is, he is, until January, the Democratic majority leader of the Senate. Mm -hmm. Yet he was my campaign manager in Rutland County, and I ran as a Republican. So that should strongly suggest that we had a great relationship. He's a great guy. His father was a great guy. And between the two of them and their family, they've done a lot for Rutland County. It's a name that's gold in Rutland County. 
and uh, we're hoping that his son, who's an attorney in Pulteney, will be appointed to fill his vacancy. Uh, but Bill Karras and I, and, 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 and as you say, you, know, you, you, you walk away from the legislature with a lot of things. For me, it's really an extended family. Oh, yeah. Bill Karras is now a member of that extended family. We'll be friends forever. It's like when I walk back into the State House, although I was only there for a few years, when I walk back in there and I see people I serve, they, they may have been people that I had no relationship with, Right. but they come up to you. It's the State House will never leave me. You know, I, I may have left there a right. bit jaded towards part of the system, but I, I'm also very appreciative. Like, how many times have you had somebody come up to you and tell you you were all wrong because they watched that 30 second sound bite on the news and suddenly they knew more than you that, that sat through? Right. Uh, that happens from time to time. Um, it's uh, frustrating. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, uh, on balance, uh, it's the final product that counts. And uh, I often say, let's let's give it a chance to work and try not to be critical, but try to, you know, it, you never get exactly what you want or what you think is best. But oftentimes, uh, through the legislative process, the art of compromise, you come up with something that everybody feels comfortable with. And by and large, it's usually a pretty good decision. Now, and, and you, you have been viewed over the years as, as a centrist. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you didn't always go with the Republicans, and you were known to go with the Democrats over the years. Right. It, aren't we losing that, though? Well, with the newer members, I think that's true. And very frankly, I think with the, with, with, with the, the folks who are now uh, the majority of the voters, uh, it's more partisanship, and people uh, oftentimes will vote for the party over the person, which is unfortunate because... Uh, there, just because someone runs as a Republican or a Democrat doesn't make them a bad person or a likely lousy legislator or have wrong ideas, that kind of thing. Uh, by and large, people uh, uh, choose a political party at, at, like I did at a young age. I was recruited by the Republicans and uh, always felt some loyalty to the Republicans, but nonetheless, uh, voted uh, the issues as I saw them, and that's why I uh, very strongly toyed with the idea of running as an independent, uh, to avoid that, uh, the fact that 25 or 30 percent of the people will automatically write you off simply because of the letter after your name. Right. Personally, I think that's the way to go as an independent, because I, uh, I look at some of the independents of, of uh, today, because a lot of times independence means liberal. But on the other hand, you have Adam uh, Gresham, who owns a ski area. You know, you don't ever, he's an independent who you don't know how he's going to vote. Or, or Will, and I, it's escaping my uh, memory what his name is, uh, he's the same way. Is, uh, and they say you don't have any power as an independent. I'm not quite sure if that's, uh, that's true. I think uh, you're actually sought after sometimes. That's right. It depends on the issue. I mean, there are super majorities in the Vermont legislature right now on the Democratic side. So the independent or Republican is not as sought after. Right. But there will come a time again when the pendulum swings and there's more of a balance. And that's where the independents can play a role. In the Senate, I obviously had a great relationship with the Democrats. I was chairman of a committee uh, in an overwhelmingly Democratic Senate. And that was in part due to seniority, in part due to the ability to get the job done. And uh, the fact that I always treated uh, my colleagues with respect, whether they were a Republican, Democrat, progressive, or independent. In fact, I think I had the best committee in the State House the last two years. Senate Economic Development, we had Senator Doyle, who's the Republican leader, Senator Karras, who's the Democratic leader, Tim Ash, progressive from Burlington, uh, and uh, the, the fifth member was Senator Peter Galbraith from Wyndham County, former ambassador, his father, a world famous economist who served as ambassador to India under President John Kennedy. So I had a, a dynamic committee with experience in government, business, uh, history. Uh, and, uh, that, those, and, 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 and those folks will be my friends forever, regardless of whether they continue in public service uh, or, or whether I do in the future. I know with myself, uh, I, know, I know some of my colleagues uh, they uh, they were a bit surprised that by my third year I'd already put on been put on a leadership role on the health care committee which was a pr pretty important role but I think it was like you though is 
you can't go down here with your own ideology and you've got to go down here and be willing to work with people because there are people like I often I often uh, uh, like watching the media a lot of times they will continue to go to the same people uh, who just say these absurd things and they make it look like that's the normal way of thinking down here well um I think uh, oftentimes what draws press coverage is the extreme and the absurd. Right. And unfortunately, that's usually a footnote or you know 1% of what really happens there. Uh, the, the, the nuts and bolts of what happens is usually not technically newsworthy. And so a lot of the folks... And a lot of it's boring. Right. And a lot of the folks who do that kind of work don't get the recognition they deserve. Yeah, because, uh, you know, if you ask, you know... The one thing I did when I was in the State House, I always I had a weekly column explaining how things worked, explaining what was going on, because I think the average person thinks that the majority of the uh, what goes on happens on in the well of the house. Right. When in reality, it's the cramped rooms with all the lobbyists around, right. with the special interest people. Right. And you're just you're you're. You're right in there. That's right. And it's not all exciting work. It's not, uh, there's not a. Yep. But the thing is, it's, it was it served as the best education for me. Like, you have a law degree, but I bet you your law degree doesn't hold anything compared That's to what right. you learned. That's right. The legislature is a world class education. Uh, you know, you talk about liberal arts and getting a sampling of different uh, areas of uh, interest. But when you serve in the legislature, not only do you cover every potential subject that's, uh, except for religion, it's pretty much uh, the waterfront when it comes to professions and businesses and trades and, and policies. And uh, so it's uh, by, uh, and, and you're right, the decisions are made uh, either in leadership or in committees. By the time it gets to the floor, it's by and large a done deal. Very frankly, uh, does the floor action or the debate on the floor change one vote? Yeah. Most people who get to the floor already have decided how they're going to vote. And uh, the purpose of the floor debate is to uh, essentially, uh, at least for some, give it one last chance to perhaps change the predetermined course. So uh, we also have a mutual friend who, she was a giant in her own time in the uh, in legislature, but not as not as a Mm -hmm. Senator, not as a re representative, but as the widow of the mm -hmm. late mm -hmm. great uh, U.S. Senator George Aiken, right. Lola, Lola Aiken. Well, Lola and I have a lot in common. Uh, first of all, she's of my father's generation. Okay. She's, uh, you know, 100 years old. My father's going to be 93 this summer. She grew up in Barrie. She's Italian. Her maiden name was Parati. And uh, they often joked about how George Aiken didn't have to campaign. But if you had spent any time at all with Lola Aiken, you know that she was the one who campaigned oh, for him 24-7. Uh, if you went into the coffee corner in Montpelier, she was always, to this day, when she was, she's not there now anymore, she's at an a, a assisted care facility, but she was always uh, talking about how great George was, uh, referred to him as the governor. Yep, she still does. And uh, he, um, and so our, we all knew that it was really Lola Aiken who was the power behind George Aiken. Why would he have to campaign? She had already done it for him. And she was telling me the secret of George's memory, especially in later years, was the she would whisper, because she, she has an uncanny right. ability to remember the finest details. Right. But, you know, she's watched decades of government. Yep. And she's not really impressed with the direction things have been going over recent years. That's right. And, uh, of course, you know, she hearkens back to a, a generation, you know, like my father. They were born um, j just to right around the time of the Depression. My father was born, you know, 10 years before the Depression really hit and uh, in a different country, of course, but the Depression was worldwide. We often think of it in terms of right. the United States. And so they had a tough upbringing. Uh, you know, they were frugal. They didn't have a lot of money. And uh, that uh, attitude uh, has kind of been forgotten as those generations have died off and uh, retired from public life. So it's, uh, it's really a different, you know, like in this day and age, we, uh, what do we, spend 40 or 40, 
for every, we borrow 40 to 45 cents of every dollar we spend at the federal level, that would have been unheard of during their day. They would have spent what they had and no more. And so it really has caused her frustration and very frankly concern that, about the future of the country. And she thinks there's going to be a fiscal cliff, but not the one that they're talking about in the news today, the one that, where the, the, the economy will simply unravel because uh, we have overspent uh, uh, our, our ability to, uh, to tax the people. So you've been part of the, the landscape at the State House for more than 30 years. Is, right. Are we going to be seeing any more of Vince Aluzzi? Well, uh, I've been asked to uh, lobby for a couple of organizations. Uh, it's been made public. I might lobby for the Vermont State Employees. Uh, there's another organization that has sought me uh, as a lobbyist, and uh, you know, we'd like you to to represent us because you'll have a little more time on your hands. I'm not sure I will have more time on my hands, but it's great to to be sought after uh, because uh, it, it I, I think reflects an acknowledgement that I. Uh, do understand the process. I've uh, made some very good friends. I mean, look at who's running state government now. My, you know, some of my closer colleagues, uh, Peter Shumlin, Jeb Spalding, and others who serve in uh, the executive branch as well as in the leadership on the Senate side. So I'm looking forward to uh, to working with them in some capacity, whether it's a, as a member of the General Assembly or as a lobbyist or as a consultant. If if things should happen, if uh, say say Governor Shumlin should ever decide to aspire for the U.S. government, which, you know, Senator Leahy's not getting any younger. Right. Would you consider running for governor? Well, um, you know, I just ran for auditor and did not succeed, and I qu quite don't know how to digest that loss. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why people vote for or against the candidate, and, uh, you know, ultimately it's the candidate's responsibility to get elected, and I didn't get elected. I would have bet a year's paycheck that you were going to win. Yeah. I, had, I remember even telling you, but Vince, you're going to win. Why, why worry? Yeah. And, uh, and you said even, even uh, the winner was totally shocked that he'd won. Right, right. Um, it was, uh, I could tell during the summer that running as a Republican was an issue. I'm sure it wasn't the only issue, but uh, it was a big year. Vermont is the bluest of blue states. And uh, that was disappointing <clears throat> and surprising, I might add. But nonetheless, uh, you know, as I said in my, in my closing argument, uh, uh, here are the people rule and the people who got out and voted, uh, voted for my opponent, and that's the way the political process works. I think, uh, I think you lost with so much grace, though. I think losing sometimes, how you react, is actually a better sign of who somebody is. Because I remember it wasn't, you know, too many years ago when somebody lost, and he went and wrote letters in the paper, trashing the constituents for not voting for him. And that really opened your eyes to who a person is. And, you know, you didn't sit back and say, well, I'm not disappointed. Because if you weren't disappointed, everybody would have known you. Right. You'd be lying. Because right. Because of course you'd be disappointed. Right, right. No, I was, it was a disappointment, but... You know, as, as a lot of people have said, when one door closes, others open. And, you know, here I am uh, being asked to, 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 to undertake other responsibilities and roles. Now, I've told people, I, I've, I've told you this, is uh, I, love, I love to predict races. I love to predict things. Uh, this last time, I was horribly off on just about everything. So <laughs> when I say I like to predict, uh, you don't want to bring me to a horse race. <laughs> but I will tell you, I've been telling people, I'd be willing to bet X amount of money that I that in two years I'll be seeing your name back on the senatorial ticket. Well, uh, we'll see how that you know plays out. Two years is a long time, and uh, appreciate you know that vote of confidence. And because uh, you are to be realistic, is not everybody likes you because you know what you can't make everybody right, happy. Right. But there's no ifs ands or buts. Right. I I used to tell people is it's okay to like, not to like Vince. But he's a man who gets things done. Right. Is you have done more? I would dare say that you've done more for the Northeast Kingdom yeah. than probably any other senator or any other representative in at least recent history. Well, that's a very nice compliment, and I thank you very much. Uh, I uh, I think one of my keys to success has been the ability to. Uh, know how to get to the finish line. A lot of folks go down there with great ideas, great intentions. They're great people themselves, 
but they simply cannot navigate the process and bring together the coalitions necessary to get to the final objective of getting legislation enacted that you can support and be proud of. And that's what I ma was able to master over the 32 years that I was there, building the relationships, understanding the process, and knowing where and when to prod and push and pull. And that's how you get the job done at the State House. Do you know one, uh, one legislator here that has been, I was always amazed with him, how respected he is, how thoughtful he is, and he doesn't get a lot of press, but he gets so much done is Mike Marcotte. Mike's a great guy. He, he's a vice chair of the House Commerce Committee, which was my counterpart. So toward the end of the session, when you have conference committees, uh, we had a chance to work together. And uh, he's a very decent, sincere person. I think the folks in uh, this area are, uh, are lucky to have him continue to serve. Yeah, I, I just, uh, he's vi even when I disagreed with him, or even when I disagree with him, that's okay because he has, he's thought out everything, he's researched, he bases his, he doesn't just vote based on what his party tells him to. Right. And you know what I tell people is, when you're choosing a candidate, uh, one question you should ask them is, okay, I know you can disagree, I know you can fight against the other party, that's, that's a no-brainer, right. but are you willing to stand up against your own party? Right. Because that takes true guts, because I have been in that situation, mm -hmm. and I know you have been, right. and you've got to admit, right. you, it's, it's, it's easy for you to go up against the Democrats, because that's what people envision, your, but when you have to stand up against your own party, that right. makes you feel a bit uncomfortable. It's been, it's been difficult, but because I've done it for so long, people could never predict that I would vote with my own party. I actually worked very closely with the Democrats. And particularly when the Senate was balanced, you know, 16, 14, 14, 16, and that's where it made a difference. I remember one year in the early 90s, we were trying to raise the minimum wage, I think 10 cents. The Republicans were all lined up against it. It was 16 to 14. I voted with the uh, Democrats, the bill passed, and uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, I, I think I did the right thing. Yeah. Uh Okay, do you have any... Um... No, I think it's a great that you do these shows. Uh, it's, uh, it's important to take the time to m memorialize, you know, who does what in the community and the history. And, you know, maybe someday, 50 years from now, somebody will watch this program and say, who are those two birds and what are they talking about? <laughs> but at least in our generation, it's, uh, it's very much appreciated. So thanks for what you do. I, and I appreciate it. And thank you for your years of service. And I, I suspect we'll be seeing your name in some form, still in the media. Okay, as long as it's not in the post office on the wall. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to the viewers for tuning in to another segment of the Northeast Kingdom Voice.